Shalom to all our participants from around the world. I am Shiloh Miriam, a Jewish descendant from the Anusim of Portugal. It is with enormous pleasure that our online conferences and shirim are back after a recent break where I have been focusing on our next shirim series, which will be advertised shortly. There are many different topics and guest speakers, speakers with many surprises. Please keep in tune. I have also, like many of you who follow my work, been very focused on the new rabbinical committee that has been formed for the Bnei Anusim. If you wish to know more about my next shirim and my work, please subscribe to my newsletter and YouTube channel, The Return of the Bnei Anusim. I hope you all had a meaningful and easy day today on a day when we mourn the destruction of our two temples and numerous tragedies that happened to our Jewish people over the centuries. As we gather here today on this very sad day that led to our dispersion to the four corners of the earth, Israel is still under attack. While so many centuries have passed since we were expelled from our temple and land, our enemies continue to try and eradicate our existence. It is because today is such a special and significant day that I could not leave it as a blank canvas. Instead, I decided to enlighten you today about the Sephardi Jewish community that it is very resilient and unique. Its own Jewish community describes itself as a community with no discrimination between both Jews and non-Jews. Cuba, the land of Havana cigars and salsa, the land of Fidel Castro and its regime, could not surprise more. We all know that the temple was destroyed because of the sins and hatred between Jews. Let us see what Cuba has to teach us from its own example. We can believe that one day when Moshiach comes and our temple is rebuilt, surely a new conscience in the world will occur. A new kind of kindness and acceptance of all ethnicities and Hashem's glory. It is of note that Jews have not always lived peacefully in Cuba. Many of the so-called conversos from Portugal and Spain found refuge in Cuba until the Inquisition arrived in South America. Today's conference, we will focus on the journey of the Sephardi Jewish community in Cuba. But equally, we will try to give a glance at what was in the past and is how the relationship is between Sephardim and Ashkenazim in Cuba. The challenge of today's shiur relates to the history of the community and the facts relating to the persecution of the conversos for centuries in Cuba. Only in recent times has there been a serious historical study and discovery about this small but fascinating Jewish community. I welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Catriel Sabalius from Israel, as it is still a fast day in Israel, we have pre-recorded his presentation. We also try in consideration for those who have been uh, fasting all day to keep this shiur today a little bit shorter than usual, usual. And we will also screen a complimentary vid video about the history of Cuba. It will not be possible to have a Q&A live, as we always do in our conferences and shirim, but you are all free and welcome to email me with questions which will be passed on to our guest speaker. I present you now Mr. Catriel, and I hope you like this humble presentation of the Safadi jury in Cuba. Thank you. Oh. Uh, in the introduction and uh, providing this platform 
and I hope that uh, some of what I'm going to say you will find interesting. It can be said without exaggeration that Sephardi Judaism in Cuba is as old as Cuba herself. When Cristobal Colón or Columbus sailed for the Americas in 1492, he took with him uh, along an interpreter proficient in Arabic as he thought uh, that he was going to discover a western passage to India and uh, the ways leading to India at the time were dominated by Arabs. The interpreter, who also served as the mission physician, was named Luis de Torres and he was a Jew, a native of Cadiz, recently forcibly baptized. There were two other Jews on Columbus ships. De Torres, the first European to set foot on American soil, arguably since the Vikings, was sent by Columbus into the interior of Cuba to ascertain the character of the island and of its people and to find its king. Later, de Torres accompanied Hernán Cortés to Mexico, where he discovered tobacco smoked by the natives, which he brought back to Cuba and cultivated there, effectively founding one of our main national industries. De Torres settled and died in Cuba, thus becoming the first Cuban Jew. Unfortunately, the place of his burial is not known. There were many Jews among the early Spanish settlers, particularly women forcibly baptized and sent to the West Indies by the Spanish authorities. The Inquisition was not slow to follow them, obviously. The first known case of the Inquisition in Cuba was the proceedings against Juan Francisco Gomez de Leon, a slave trader arrested aboard his ship when she arrived with a cargo of slaves from Angola at Havana Harbor in 1613. Eventually, he was uh, imprisoned and executed in Cartagena, what is now Colombia, and the Inquisition confiscated his fortune amounting to 149,000 pesos, which by, at that time was an enormous sum. In 1627, the Inquisition seized Jews Antonio Mendes, Luis Rodriguez and others, and in 1636, 150,000 pesos in gold was extorted from three Jewish citizens of Havana persecuted for practicing their faith. Their names were Blas de Paz Pinto, Juan Rodriguez Mesa, and Francisco Rodriguez de Solis. And they appeared to have been among the wealthiest men in the West Indies. The trial of Gabriel de Granada, which took place in 1642, also involved his uncle, Miguel Núñez de Huerta, who was supposed to be in uh, Havana at that time and whose bones in 1649 were used by the Inquisition for his execution in effigy. They didn't even leave alone dead people. About the same time, Luis Mendes de Chavez, Luis Gomez Barreto and Manuel Álvarez Prieto, all of Havana, were in the clutches of the Inquisition for practicing Judaism. In 1689, Vicente Gomez Coelho, a Portuguese, was denounced as a Jew in Cuba. The prosecution of Cuban Jews continued into the next century. In 1712, Jacobo Núñez López was denounced as a Jew. As late as 1783, the Inquisition claimed victims, uh, such as Juan Rodríguez Mejía and Antonio Santaeo of Havana. These are but a few of the many names of Jews in Cuba who have been charged by the Inquisition. However, our early history was not all doom and gloom. Hernando de Castro, a Jew, has been created with the introduction of the culture of sugar in Cuba. Thus, uh, both of our main national industries, tobacco and sugar, were introduced by Jews. Two wealthy Jewish families, Pimenta and Ferreira, uh, founded the construction of Nuestra Señora de la Santísima Trinidad, the greatest ship of the Age of Sail, launched in Havana in, 16, uh, in uh, 1769. I'm sorry. Incidentally, according to historian Levin, early records show that in uh, 1762, during a 10-month period of British occupation of Cuba, international trade was opened up and Jewish merchants were permitted to sail with the British fleet led by Admiral George Pocock, who had captured Havana the previous summer. And the author of Cuban national anthem, Pedro Felipe Figueredo Cisneros, 
or Perucho Figueiredo, who fell in the liberation war in 1870, was a practicing Jew. Which brings us to the next chapter of Cuban Sephardi history, now in the independent Cuba. The Republic was established in 1902, and it attracted Jewish immigrants from the Ottoman Empire. They're speaking an old uh, variant of Spanish inherited from the ancestors who were expelled from Spain in 1492, paved the way to their relatively easy integration to Cuba. Little by little, community life was established. In 1906, an Algerian-born Jew, Halida, founded Sephardi Burial Society. Eventually, Sephardim acquired a lot of, a plot of land in Guanabacoa, just outside of Havana, for their own cemetery. The first Sephardi synagogue, Shebe Dahim, was founded in 1914 by a Turkish-born publican. For a time being, it had no rabbi, and the first cantor was a gentleman named Cohen. At that time, one Maurice Soriano, a Sephardi from Smyrna, brought motion pictures to Cuba. In 1923, a Chacham, Rabbi, Chacham is the traditional Sephardi title for a rabbi, named Gershon Maya, arrived from Turkey. He belonged to a long lineage of uh, illustrious rabbis in Selivri. He served the community until his death in 1938. Among other things, he established a Sephardi school in Havana, Theodor Herzl, that also admits the Ashkenazi pupils. Other Sephardi rabbis in Cuba included Moshe Fins, Nisim Maya, Isaac Shiprut Konfi, Victor Farin Sarfati, and Nisim Gambash, all of Turkish birth. And the Rafael Yair M. Nadav, a Yemeni Jew from Israel who was contracted after Haham Fins emigrated to Israel, he served mostly as a Hazan, or cantor. Communities existed in Havana, Santiago de Cuba, and Matanzas. Their founders primarily originated in Silivri and Edirne in Turkey. Among the Turkish Cuban Sephardi families, we can name Behar, Levi, Barrocas, Motola, Albuquerque, Franco, Salinas, Saranga, Mitrani, Russo, Vichachi, Meshulam, Abravanel, Egosi, Adato, Vavani, etc. And the uh, interesting uh, thing that the uh, Albuquerque family. Uh, descended from the Duke of Alburquerque of Spain, and one of its members, Matilde Albuquerque, had a tragic life, uh, which uh, was uh, described by her daughter in a book that uh, was published in the United States. The book is called Asylum, and it's uh, well worth reading. Now, Isidro Abravanel, a textile industrialist uh, born in Gallipoli, uh, was the Havana community president and a member uh, of the same yacht club as President Batista of Cuba. I don't know how much honor it is. Batista was not a good president, but um, it was uh, quite an accomplishment in those days. In general, uh, Cuban Jews uh, belonged to uh, middle class. Cuban Sephardim were passion Zionists and sent volunteers to fight an Israeli independent war in 1948. Two of those, David Mitrani and Daniel Levy, were killed aboard the, the ship Altalena, which was uh, dispatched from Europe by one of the warring Jewish uh, factions, uh, the Ergun, by another Jewish faction, the Haganah. Prior to Castro takeover in 1959, there were 5,000 Turkish Sephardi in Havana and an unknown number of descendants of the original Sephardi settlers who maintained Jewish faith and identity. Among the latter, I'm proud to name my own family. Also from that origin is Jenny Milgram, who went to great lengths to establish her family history and published a book called My 15 Grandmothers about it. Castro's scope had disastrous consequences for the community life, causing mass immigration and eventual extinction of Sephardi right that uh, finally occurred in 1984 with the death of the Havana cantor and Chacham, Salomon Susi. For the sake of historical accuracy, it must be said that there was also a substantial Ashkenazi community in Cuba. There was at one time even a Yiddish language newspaper published in Havana, and there was even a Jewish opera in Yiddish uh, written by a Jewish composer in Cuba. But that's another story for another day. Thank you very much for your attention.
I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and that you know I have now a general idea of the history of the Safadi Jewry in Cuba and how the Cuban Jewry community has blended into a united spirit between all the Jewish ethnicities. Um, it is indeed inspirational on a day like today to reflect and give us food for thought on how can we as Jews be more united as one. I thank Mr. Catriel Ceballos for his time and insights. I thank you for participating tonight. Tonight it is short, uh, insightful, and most of all, inspirational message today on the day we mourn the destruction of our temple. A special thank you to all co-sponsors and donors who make this event possible. To the participants, I also thank you for registering and being part of this conference. I hope I see you all in our next shiur. And if you have questions, please email me and I'll make sure our guest speaker will reply to you. Thank you so much. I hope you have a, now a meaningful rest after the fasting. Thank you.